Mastering the market cycle. What is the difference between mastering the market cycle and timing the market? I think timing the market is guessing at what's going to happen tomorrow. In my opinion, the key to ma mastering the market cycle is understanding where it is today. As an experienced veteran with a deep understanding of market cycles, Marx's perspectives carry significant weight. Investors would be wise to heed his warnings. What are the seven worst words in For the world? For an investor, too much money chasing too few deals. When, when uh, there are too many willing buyers and they're too avid and they have too much money, Prices go up like and any returns other law. Go down. Returns go down and risk goes up and safety goes down. And that's one of the things that it's essential to be aware of and to act accordingly. The commercial real estate and highly leveraged companies supposedly face a doomed future, as foretold by the renowned investor Howard Marks. That's very important. We never know what the future holds. Remember what I said. You can't do anything which is sure to be right or or, or anything close to certainty. Before we delve into it, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of the craziest info we have on investment or the economy. In Mark's latest market commentary, the renowned investor and Oak Tree Capital co-founder shared his concerns about the potential challenges facing the commercial real estate sector and highly leveraged companies. In this video, we'll dive into Marx's analysis and explore the implications for those invested in these vulnerable areas of the market. So that's a great segue. I, I'm going to uh, move into commercial property. Mm -hmm. um, I hear you've been making the media rounds bad-mouthing commercial property, so we're going we're gonna to delve into this a little bit. In his latest market commentary, Howard Marx has adopted a notably cautious stance when it comes to the commercial real estate sector. Moving to the uh, real estate mortgage market, a uh, $4.5 trillion market, about seven or 800 billion matures each of the next four or five years. A third of loans are floating rate. Um, and, you know, a lot of uh, multifamily and some office. Um, and again, probably a need to inject five, 600 billion over the coming years uh, to. Um, maintain loan to value. So uh, I guess I'm asking where what your opinion is of, of uh, that market and where do you see opportunity? Well, um, I, I believe that, as I said before, when interest rates go up, the notional value of all assets goes down. And Last year, we saw the fastest increase in interest rates in history. The Fed funds rate went from zero to four and a half in nine months. Never been anything like that before. Uh, and, uh, and, at, and, and at the same time, uh, psychology swings from, you know, I always say that, that uh, in the real world, things fluctuate between pretty good and not so hot. But in terms of investor psychology, it goes from flawless to hopeless. And, uh, you know, we're on the way. We've made some, nobody thinks the outlook is flawless anymore. I don't think anybody has accepted that it's hopeless, and I don't know if they, if they will, but certainly uh, psychology is more moderate today than it was. So you have higher rates, depressing value, you have a negative swing in psychology, and then in certain sectors, you have a, uh, a real uh, deterioration of fundamentals, long-term fundamentals, maybe office. And certainly, as, as you said before, certainly, uh, uh, office that's not great properties. Old. Old. Old or ill-located or, right. or something like that. Um, so, uh, now nobody can say whether the 25% decline of REITs is appropriate, not enough, or too much. Um, but, uh, you know, anything which hasn't been marked down is suspect. He highlighted the substantial price appreciation and rent increases that have characterized the commercial real estate market in recent years. However, he cautions that these trends may not be sustainable, particularly in light of the changing economic and market conditions that lie ahead. So the way I think of this, and this is described in the book at length, because I think it's important, is the future is like a lottery. There's a bowl, and it's full of lottery tickets. And the lottery tickets are the possible future outcomes, and there are many of them. 
And it's because there are many possible future outcomes <clears throat> that the world is uncertain and investing is risky. And something, fate or whatever you want to call it, reaches into the bowl and pulls one ticket. All the tickets in the bowl are the possible outcomes, and the one that is selected is the actual outcome. And we never know which one it's going to be. You reach in the bowl, you get a ticket. It could be any of the tickets in the bowl, and there are many. A key factor underpinning Marx's cautious view is the prospect of rising interest rates. He notes that as the Federal Reserve continues to hike rates in an effort to tame inflation, the financing costs for real estate transactions are likely to increase significantly. Well, I wonder what kind of opportunities you're finding. I'm always interested um, on the distress side uh, about how sort of target rich the environment is. I think that says a lot about our economy. All the economic surprises that we see are uh, to the downside lately and rates remain high. Does that make this interesting for you? Well, I think it is interested. I mean, we we went through a really uh, slow period from 09 when the Fed took the Fed funds rate to zero to stimulate the economy to 21 when they started to decided to lift it to fight inflation. And in that 13 year period, there was very little distress because it was a very benign environment for companies. Uh, uh, now, as you note, uh, interest rates are higher. Uh, that gives us an, more of an opportunity. And importantly, there were a lot of leveraged transactions uh, done in the period I described. Uh, where companies were uh, burdened with capital structures, debt structures, that did not anticipate a 500 basis point or 400 basis point increase in rates. So, you know, to, to put it uh, in, in short, it was, it was a great time to be a borrower because rates came down and business was prosperous. But right now, and I think going into the future, uh, uh, leveraged companies will not be able to renew their leverage as easily, and the cost of doing so will be higher. This, in turn, could put downward pressure on property values, as higher borrowing costs make it more challenging for investors and developers to justify the same level of asset prices. Beyond the impact of rising rates, Marx also points to the potential implications of evolving work and consumer trends for the commercial real estate market. The pandemic-driven shift towards remote and hybrid work arrangements, for instance, has already led to a substantial rise in office vacancy rates as companies reevaluate their real estate needs. If you were to take it across the board, including the big box retail and the offices that are not being utilized and sized down right now, we're probably at about a 20 to 25 percent vacancy. Commercial real estate developer Dick Anagnost says New Hampshire has held pretty steady as office workforces restructure themselves with a shift to a more remote environment. Similarly, the e-commerce boom, which has been further accelerated by the COVID-19 crisis, has put significant strain on the traditional retail real estate sector. Of user behavior, more people are used to shop on smartphone and more people used to pay on smartphone. Welcome back to Squawk Box this morning. Consumers are shifting their spending from in-store to online and e-commerce presence has now become so critical for businesses just to stay afloat. And many rely on platforms like cloud-based Shopify, which has now jumped 73% since the WHO declared a pandemic in mid-March. Shopify powers sites for 1 million businesses worldwide. Marx anticipates that this shift in consumer behavior could persist potentially leading to a wave of store closures and lease renegotiations that could undermine the performance of retail properties. Given these various headwinds, Marx believes that the commercial real estate market could be poised for a period of declining rents and asset values. He cautions that the combination of rising financing costs and weaker fundamentals in certain real estate sectors, such as office and retail, could result in substantial challenges for landlords, investors, and property owners. Mark believes that investors may be better positioned to weather any potential storms that may arise in the commercial real estate landscape if they yield to his warnings. Mark's main concern is the vulnerability of companies that have taken on too much debt. While debt can be helpful for growing and expanding a business, relying too much on it can make a company very vulnerable, especially during uncertain economic conditions. Right. It's certainly not the red flag we're seeing, uh, perhaps in some debt markets. Yeah, I think that 
you know, uh, in, in this, in the, in recent years, not a lot of money has been flowing into equities. A lot has been flowing into debt. People like the idea of having a debt instrument, which is going to pay interest and then give you your money back at a point in time. Uh, they are assured by that, so that makes the money flow in. When the money flow in flows in, that means the buyers at the auction have more money to spend, and that tends to put the prices up. And with securities, price up, future return down. Safety down, risk up. So, credit is an idea. Uh, Mark's main concern uh, is the vulnerability of companies that have taken on too much debt. While debt can be helpful for growing and expanding a business, relying too much on it can make a company very vulnerable, especially during uncertain economic conditions. He points out that when a company has a lot of debt, it has less financial flexibility to deal with unexpected challenges or take advantage of new opportunities. Yeah. Uh, so right now you've also written that it appears that debt instruments are going to be found at ground zero right. when things right. go wrong this time. Uh, you know, we've been talking about leverage loans. They seem like the new boogeyman sure. on Wall Street. Yes. What do you think of them? Well, I mean, that's that, yeah. the key for you and your viewers and everybody to understand is that there's no such thing as a good idea or a bad idea until we can talk about price. It's not what you buy, I always say, it's what you pay. So I think that leveraged loans are a great idea. They, they pay interest, they repay principal, they're senior in the issuers, and they are generally tied to floating rate loads so you don't have interest rate risk. All good things, mm -hmm. at what price? And no matter how good the merits are, it's possible for things to become overpriced when money is flowing in strongly and it is to leverage loans, then they can become overpriced and some are. Marx also mentions that heavily indebted firms often struggle to handle even small setbacks to their revenue or efficiency as a large portion of their cash flow goes toward paying off their debt. Additionally, highly leveraged companies face increased risk in the current environment of rising interest rates. Today's data shows many Americans are beginning to really feel the ripple effect of the Fed's interest rate hikes over the past year and a half. Now, while consumers are still spending, they're getting a lot less for their money. Surely you will know this. At the same time, the cost of carrying loans and credit card balances, that has grown even more expensive. As the Federal Reserve continues to raise rates to control inflation, the costs of financing for these heavily indebted firms can increase quickly, putting even more pressure on their financial resources and potentially making it difficult for them to meet their debt obligations. Mark's warning is a clear reminder for investors to be extra careful when considering investments in companies with a lot of debt. Gone are the days when investors could ignore the debt of target firms in hopes of making money. It is now crucial to thoroughly research and analyze the debt levels, financing structures, and overall financial health of any potential investment. Given Mark's grim outlook for heavily indebted companies, investors should prioritize finding companies that are financially strong and flexible. Well, as I've said, um, you know, the last 14 years were really quite idyllic uh, in, the, in the economy and in the market. We had the longest bull market in history, the longest economic recovery in history. Uh, we set a lot of records in many ways. Living was easy. Interest rates were low. Companies can get all the money they wanted. There are very few defaults or bankruptcies. You know, uh, easy times. And uh, I don't believe in forecasts, especially my own. Uh, Oak Tree, as I mentioned, does not invest according to forecasts. But in general, we think that the living will be a little less easy in, in, the, uh, in the months and years to come. So I, I think, you know, for us, the big question is, is it going to be easy times like the last 14 years or more back to normal. Companies that manage their debt wisely have diverse sources of revenue and can withstand economic challenges are likely to be more attractive investment options in the current environment. In light of Marx's warning, investors need to be cautious of the potential debt trap that could affect heavily indebted companies, especially with the rising interest rates. By avoiding investments in companies that are on the brink of financial trouble, investors may be able to steer clear of the domino effects of defaults and the resulting disruptions in the market. To reduce the risks associated with heavily leveraged companies, 
it might be wise for investors to diversify their portfolios by spreading their investments across various industries and sectors that have different levels of susceptibility to these challenges. Furthermore, adopting a defensive investment approach that emphasizes capital preservation over aggressive growth could be a sensible strategy in the current market conditions. Hey everyone, thanks for following along. I believe that by taking into account Mark's insights and integrating his lessons into your investment decision-making process, you could potentially avoid getting caught up in debt. However, it's important not to rely solely on this advice. Take the time to do your own research and seek out opportunities for yourselves. Once you've done that, let's have a discussion. Share your thoughts in the comments about Howard's predictions regarding highly leveraged companies and the real estate sector. Thanks for watching as always. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on future economic news. See you in the next video. It feels to me, however, that you are, if you will, sounding the alarm. Yes. Is it fair to say that you're sounding the alarm? Well, I'm calling for caution. Uh, Is that alarm, the same thing? Alarm sounds alarming. And I don't <laughs> want to be an alarmist. And I don't think it's appropriate to be an alarmist today. But, you know... The economy has gone upward for almost 10 years. The markets have gone upward for almost 10 years. The too much money phenomenon is certainly underway. It would be a mistake to have as much risk in your portfolio today as you did two years ago, five years ago, or 10 years ago. You have to acknowledge that. I use the term calibrate. Today is not the time for max risk, full risk, or for, in my opinion, evenly balancing offense and defense. Your, your portfolio should be skewed toward less risk. Yes, but not extremely.